First off, we at The Familiar Strange want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we are recording this podcast, and pay our respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, past, present and emerging. Let's go! Hello and welcome to The Familiar Strange. I'm Jodie Tremba, your familiar stranger today. I'm recording this intro from underneath the blanket on my bed because I'm currently in Sweden and I tried to record this from my desk at the Stockholm Centre for Organisational Research but it has these gorgeous high ceilings which sadly do not produce good podcast sound. Today I'm bringing you a podcast about a topic that I am so passionate about that I am doing a PhD about it. The neoliberal university. It's been a rough year for academics of the neoliberal university. And frankly, it's not an easy time in history to work in the public sector in most countries. So even though I recorded this interview with Professor Chris Shaw last December at the Shifting States Conference in Adelaide, a lot of what he says here is particularly resonant right now. But it's made me think through the mission of the public sector and my own place in it, and I hope it does that for you too. Professor Chris Shaw is an anthropologist of policy with a particular interest in neoliberalisation of the public sector and audit cultures and also corruption. So we talk particularly in this interview about his new book with Susan Wright, Professor of Educational Anthropology, and that book is called The Death of the Public University. We talk about the precarious future of public universities. We talk about how the neoliberal agenda ties into the themes of anti-intellectualism that permeate our current post-fact world. And we always come back to how anthropology and anthropological thinking can help us to unpack these big, monolithic ideas. So, here it is, me and Professor Chris Shaw talking about the prices we pay for the neoliberalisation of the public university. Maybe we could start with an idea of what is neoliberalism? What does it mean? We hear it a lot, right? Yeah, we, I think we hear it too much. Too, too, <laughs> too much is spoken about neoliberalism. Uh, personally, I, I don't like the word. I'm sort of more comfortable with uh, the, the, the term neoliberalization uh, in, insofar as that, you know, that refers to a, a set of processes, not a thing, not a, a, a static monolithic thing. I suppose from from an analytical point of view, that there are different strands that come together. Um, I, I like to think of neoliberalization as a – it is an assemblage of, of different projects that get sort of bundled up. I mean, one project was about the – you know, I, I grew up in Britain and was living there in the 80s when Mrs. Thatcher and her government – started to introduce a series of reforms that were really designed at uh, cost-cutting measures, but uh, with a political project behind the economic one of, of actually shrinking the state, you know, rolling back the frontiers of, of the welfare state. And and that version of neoliberalization involved um, outsourcing. It involved um, uh, introducing quasi markets into areas of public life where markets didn't exist and, and actually couldn't really exist, like uh, health services and, and competitive tendering. But there's another dimension that often gets confused and conflated into neoliberalism, and that's that, in a sense, the whole assault on the on the professions. And they, these are all attempts to make the workforce more accountable, more efficient and more productive. Okay, so um, I mean that's three amazing words there, right? So more accountable, more efficient, more productive. So it's hard to question the idea that accountability is a bad thing, right? Like if if we've got low quality things, then shouldn't we be improving the quality of things? And and isn't an accountability a way to do that? Well, you're right. I mean, you're right in the first part that it, it's very hard to to disagree or to challenge the the claim that you know uh, accountability is a bad thing. You know, it's, it's one of those weasel words that you you, you can't it, you, you you no reasonable self respecting rational person could possibly be opposed to accountability or transparency or, or quality. Be like saying I'm I'm against community or I yes. I, th- I think the family's a bad thing. So you can't oppose it. So you therefore have to align whatever you do. Uh, 
in terms of um, the, the mantra and the mandate to be more accountable. But what happens when you try to put that word into practice? Again, it was all part and parcel of the assault on the public sector. How do we make these public sector employees doctors, nurses, academics, teachers, firefighters, police officers. They're not subject to the the rigorous disciplines of the competitive free market. Therefore, how do we guarantee that the taxpayer is getting value for money? So they're introduced as, as a technology to render these disciplines more efficient, effective and economical. You know, the three golden E's, and then they get attached to the value for money mantra. And together, this forms a managerial package that is really quite disciplining and quite coercive in the way it's metered out. An assault implies a subject that is doing the assaulting, right? So with something like neoliberalization or um, market forces or, you know, these big ideas, who is it that's doing the assaulting? And, And you were asking, who are we accountable? Like, who is the who in these big ideas? That is a good question. In a way, we've now had 25, 30 years of a project uh, that goes under that label of, you know, neoliberalism, neoliberalization, of marketization. In in New Zealand, Australia and the UK, I mean, it sort of begins in the 80s with a a repudiation of the the, the social democratic model, a repudiation of the welfare state. uh, Because it was bad? It's the the conservative idea that best government is small government, that the role of the state should be more like the night watchman, you know, small, minimal, non-interventionist. And it's based on, a, I think, a really spurious, flawed theory that if you roll back the state and shrink it, then you, you're simply opening up space for private providers, civil society to move in there, and that somehow the state is your, your the obstacle to, to growth, entrepreneurship. And, and it began, I, I remember I was living in the UK at the time, and we used to sort of kind of almost like laugh at this label, uh, the, the idea that Mrs. Thatcher and her government were going to introduce a enterprise culture into, you know, all these kind of institutions. But what the hell is an enterprise culture? It's the wholesale transference of of the language and the idioms and the thinking of the business sector into the realm of the public sector. And actually, they jar. They don't work that well. Trying to turn your hospital into a, you know, competitive, market-driven enterprise, trying to turn a, a university into some simulacrum of a transnational business corporation... Sorry, it, it doesn't fulfill the mission of what the, the public institutions are and should be about. So that's a really interesting point. What is the mission of the public sector? And let's let's focus in on universities because that's the the area of this new book of yours. What is the mission of a university? What I mean, that sounds like an obvious question, I think. But from an anthropological perspective, what does a university do? What work does a university do? that the public sector is a sector that stands outside of the the realm and the logic of, of the market. That it's, you know, it therefore embodies the mission and the meaning, embodies a series of, a set of values that are about the public good. So you ask, you know, what's a university for? Well, I think it's it's an institution that in many respects should be free from market influence. We, otherwise, you know, it, it's a place of higher learning. And it's not simply there to fulfill commercial um, agendas or private interests. You know, it should be there as a, as a sort of resource for the nation, a bit like um, our public art galleries and our museums. You know, it's like they should be free. The nation's paid for it. it and it's, it's about um, bringing on the next generation of, uh, of leaders as well. But it's, yeah, it's also about challenging received wisdom. Um, one of the very few spaces in society where... We give license to people, scholars, to question orthodoxy and to act as critic and conscience of society. And the reason that's important, and and this is a really serious point, is democracy needs those things. So that's it. You know, I I think that there is a there's a role for a public university, uh, and it really is part and parcel of that ethos. And that ethos has been under assault. Higher education is not something, I think, that if we are sensible and wise, we would seek to protect it from the commodification. 
Otherwise, once universities are, are captured by commercial interests, then what's left? Well, yeah, what's left? I mean, that's that's a good question, isn't it? Because, I mean, if universities are the final bastion of the source of knowledge production and also the place where where knowledge can be nurtured and we take that away, what happens next? I mean, what do you see for the future given the current state of public universities? I don't know. I, I think, you know, at the moment um, higher education uh, is going through a very rocky period at the moment, um, particularly in, in the countries where uh, we have um, conservative, neoliberal inspired policy uh, agendas. The UK is, is a good example. Uh, there are conflicting agendas at work, though. On, you know, on the one hand, if I take my so my own kind of country, New Zealand, so we've got a, you know incredibly neoliberalised context. You know, we've been going going down a particular path uh, for the last thirty years that says we live by um, competition. We trade is our foreign policy. Uh, everything has to be reconceptualised as a, an investment. So this is actually an official government policy when they talk about the investment approach to higher education. So, and and the problem is that investment is is very sort of short term. This idea that you know, you, if the government puts money in universities, it expects a return. <laughs> so, which, which is why we have a, a privileging of not just STEM subjects, you know, the um, science, technology, engineering, and medicine, but STEM subjects that can deliver a return, a commercial return on investment. So there's this really rather uh, heavy, stultifying emphasis now on trying to develop parts of the university that can be commercialized. But you're, you asked me the question, you know, so what's the future of, of the public university? Um, I think if we, if we continue recklessly down this path, then it's looking very precarious. You know, I can see the breakup of the university system as we know it. Um, put it this way, if it's something that we value as a, as a nation uh, or even as, as academics and as policymakers, then it should be something that we would be prepared to invest in. You can't have a public university system that is left to its own devices uh, with progressive disinvestment of state funding told to find its own income streams uh, or to what to to increase student fees to the point where it becomes impossible for ordinary families uh, to send their kids to university so you know we, we regress to a sort of pre-war situation where you know higher education universities are only for the the children of the elite no thank you I hate to bring the, the mood down even further, but how do you see the the current climate of anti anti experts, um, post fact, not valuing expertise, not valuing intellectualism? How do you see that playing into that potential decline? I mean, the reason I ask is because you said if we value these things, and I wonder whether we, as a society, still do. <laughs> and then we all cried. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, yeah I, and here sometimes we ha we do have to draw a distinction between, you know, as a society and, and the, the quality and the caliber of the political leadership. Sure, people talk about, um, you know, he, he, we've moved into an era where um, disillusionment with the established um, ways of doing things has, has, uh, coupled with a sort of a wave of populist um, politicians has, has led to a, well, a crisis of, of trust in, in the establishment and a, a dangerous flirtation with um, people who promise to smash the establishment. And the, yeah, how do you explain the um, wave of, of populism? And, and I think that too is um, possibly a reaction to you know, the last 25, 30 years of a particular, let's call it a paradigm Let's, let's use the word neoliberal policies have all been geared to this, this ideological claim that, you know, the market has the solutions, that, that somehow that, you know, breaking up institutions of the state is going to be good. It's going to free up entrepreneurship. People have got poorer as a result. The small five, one percent have got immeasurably wealthier. And, and you know, and here is a fact, you know, that economic inequality has gone through the roof in the last 20 years. 
even in some of the more you know left leaning liberal countries even in sweden who is it that, that great book the um, the spirit level it's written by two epidemiologists who who've looked at the the effects of inequality and they point to a whole raft of, of negative consequences of societies that are most unequal have the most social and health and environmental problems hmm. and, and you know right up there is the united states um the united kingdom new zealand australia so do you think anthropology offers something as both a method and a philosophy, I suppose, that helps us to try and unpack that better, differently? Why anthropology, I suppose? I think it could. Uh, yeah, I think the, 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 just the, the simple fact that uh, it's the most reflexive discipline that I've ever encountered. It's, I mean, it's to the point of <laughs> neurosis, we're always analysing <laughs> and qu questioning <laughs> our own sort of biases and assumptions uh, yeah. and positionality. But, but I think... The fact that it's also comparative, you you can't do work try to figure out how another society operates and thinks without reflecting back on your own society. I mean, it's always been, you know, as somebody say, you know, what, what is anthropology? Well, it's a, an exploration of the self through the, the vehicle of the other, or, or it could be the other way around. You know, we're interested in trying to use ourself and our own perspective to make sense of other cultures, other people's which in turn provides us with a window and a lens back onto our, the way in which you know our society and culture operates. I think anthropology, the knowledge it produces, isn't easily commercializable. Although, actually, that said, I always think that you know you, you could throw your lot in with the devil, and we we have a, a skill set that would be the envy of most marketeers, you know, PR companies, media firms. You know, we, if you can figure out how symbols work. And anthropologists are pretty good at doing that. You know, you you can market your your knowledge to uh, salesmen and PR companies, and uh, yeah, we, we we'd be quite good at those sort of dark arts of um, advertising and commercialising. <laughs> okay, so there are there is an over proliferation of PhD students for academic jobs. Yeah. So if not academia then what's not the dark arts that you can enter as an anthropologist? Oh, but, I mean, look, it's always been the case that um, most disciplines, anthropology included, uh, produce, if I can use a horrible metaphor, this is not a, a factory conveyor <laughs> belt, you know, with well, yeah. people wheeling <laughs> off, uh, but produce more kind of PhDs than can reasonably be expected to be, you know, absorbed back into the academy. And that's not a bad thing because it's not simply about, you know, reproducing academics for the academy. And it shouldn't be. I mean, in fact, it, I mean, anthropology is a way of thinking, a way of seeing. Uh, it, it really does shape your, your disposition, how you perceive the world. It, it, it changes people's lives. It's only changed mine. I mean, you, you never see the world again in the same way. You get sensitive to the... In a sense, just the, the, the conditionality and the, and the fluidity of your own culture and the, the arbitrariness of your own culture becomes blatantly apparent to you and the social constructedness of so many things. So I think that, that I mean, anthropology producing lots of PhD students who are not going to go into universities or colleges or teaching is a great thing because actually the world needs more anthropologists. We need them in, in diplomacy. We need them in government. We need them in planning departments. Anything, any area where people interface with other people, then the anthropological skill set is is brilliantly useful. We struggle under the sort of this sort of really rather naive and and false argument that um, somehow employability lies not in the arts and the humanities or the social sciences, but in getting a, a, a serious uh, skill like, you know, marketing or business or uh, computers and uh, or law. Um, technology, I think, will, will rapidly uh, make many of those jobs um, redundant. Certainly, you know, areas like accounting, you know, uh, they these machines will be doing that far more efficiently than, than people. Um, it is probably the case that a good liberal arts degree is going to stand you in much greater stead and much more possibilities of being employed than than just training in some sort of area hmm. plus you get the value of doing something that you're really interested in studying you know studying art culture literature social science i think these areas are much more exciting 
uh, and interesting and and relevant, and it probably creates more flexible, fluid, adaptable individuals. I mean, the, the trick surely has got to be to not not to go. Why go to university just to be trained in in a particular knowledge, which is going to be uh, redundant in in five years' time? Because the things that you learn, you know, you learn this software package. Um, far better to learn how to learn, uh, to be articulate, to be um, literate to know how to synthesize material and to recognize false news from, from you know, fact from fiction and, and fabrication. to talk about practice for a bit um, and particularly because the kind of anthropology that you do and also that I do is not necessarily the traditional Malinovskian kind of anthropology, right? And in um, your book, The Anthropology of Policy, you talk about that as um, not so much studying down or studying up or even studying sideways, which I think is a Ulf Hanna's phrase, right? But you talk about studying through and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. For me, one of the, one of the most inspiring anthropologists, who, who I think certainly shaped my kind of uh, sense of, of what the discipline has to offer, was, was Laura Nader, who, you know, back in the in the early nineteen seventies, I think it was nineteen seventy three. It was in an edited book by Del Himes, and and she wrote an, a, an essay called "Up the Anthropologist," and it was a. Um, she coined the phrase studying up and, and she, she spoke about how, you know, this was a time of the, the height of the Vietnam War and she spoke about how, you know, we should, students um, should be rightfully indignant and in, indignation and anger should be a good motive for deciding what you want to look at. And rather than always studying, you know, poor peripheral peasants, pastoralists and, and fishermen, you know, let's turn the critical gaze of our discipline, which we do so well, let's pivot it round like a telescope and lens and focus upwards on the, she coined the phrase, the, the hidden hierarchies of power. And she actually specifically mentioned the banks, the insurance companies, the policy elites, the people who, who the makers and shakers. And that always kind of excited me. And I, I think most of my anthropology uh, has always been actually on on complex industrial western type societies and organizations that's been kind of my my bailiwick of interest so studying through just came about as as a sort of thinking about well we're not simply studying up because obviously you want to uh, you want to connect what is happening upstream and and with, with what takes place downstream if i can switch from a you know a kind of spatial metaphor to a sort of <laughs> uh, I, I, half I of my undergraduate degree metaphors. was geography and you know we used to um, spend a lot of time standing in streams looking at things but you can use that metaphor so that you know the things that are happening upstream obviously are going to affect if you pollute the river right from the source then it's all, all the all the gunk is going to wash out in the delta and uh, and the people living in the banks down below are going to be affected but but then also it's not a one-way flow either so we we were trying to problematize the, the notion of policy and and trying to get away from the, the the way that policy studies always treats it as a thing to try and to get them to to rethink that and to treat it as a process and to and to deconstruct it because it, there isn't such a coherent thing called policy it's a messy set of processes and it involves tacking backwards and forth and the phrase studying through actually that that was one of Sue Wright's MA students who she did a thesis on on a on a bill that how this piece of legislation was batted forward and it's a bit like a sort of i don't know piece of flotsam on the sea being buffeted forward and backwards and she sort of came up with the idea that you you have to follow i mean part of the the, the, the message for doing an anthropology of policy is like follow the policy but then if the policy isn't linear then it you know it starts with an idea that then trans mutates and gets translated into something else that then gets pushed back there and uh, you know it's this messy complicated tacking forward and backward process so that was the the kind of the source of that idea and then Sue and, and Sue Reinhold tried to refine that idea as if you're thinking of the anthropology of policy as a, as a not just a methodology but as a method then that's one way of thinking about how policy how policies work 
as an anthropologist of policy, how do you follow a policy? I mean, the, the idea of a follow that approach, uh, you know, that comes right out of the um, that 1995 article by George Marcus uh, on multi-sided ethnography. And I think he came up with sort of, you know, his idea is, uh, you know, nowadays we can't just make sense of the world by being located in the village or whatever it is or the small community and that we should really locate ourselves in multiple sites but also he he advocated to follow that approach follow that metaphor follow that conflict follow that whatever and so we we kind of thought well okay yeah and follow that policy so how do you follow that policy well you start by taking the policy makers at their own word and you you say well what do they you mentioned Malinowski. I mean, actually, Malinowski is still incredibly valid today. One of Malinowski's great lessons to us all is that treat seriously what people say about what they do, what they think they do, and what they actually do, and look at the discrepancies between those three levels. And and so one of the things you say, well, so let's start with what do the policymakers think? You know, if they say this is our policy and this is how we're going to do it, and we're going to turn this into a piece of legislation, and we're going to then once it's turned into a piece of legislation, then we're going to create uh, uh, agencies or institutions to enact them. We create street-level bureaucrats to carry it out, and we have mechanisms that fund, punish, reward, uh, incentivize, and so on. And, and then, of course, that right down at the, the bottom end of the stream, you've got the the objects, or usually they're subjects of the policy, and you know, how are they going to respond to that? So, so follow that is really looking at the different the sites, the institutions, the ideas, and the individuals, and how they all get connected into this this sort of framework. It's like policy enunciates and creates; it doesn't simply describe. So, when somebody says, "Well, we're going to have a new policy on take the United Kingdom," they've just introduced a, a new policy on higher education, and it's. You know, it's it's basically a, a formula for opening up public universities to private providers. It's made it much more easier, and it's trying to incentivize competition. It's created this thing called the the Office for Students, whose mandate is to ensure that universities provide value for money and to, and to you know go out of their way to marketize what they're doing. Um, yeah, so follow that and and see how. How those ideas get translated into practice, how they get contested, uh, how they get subverted, which hopefully they will. So how do you decide where to start? You said um, you generally start with the policy makers. No, 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 I don't think, no, I actually, I don't, I mean, in terms of, um, it's, that's a question that often gets asked, you know, if you're trying to do, uh, follow a policy and an, an anthropology policy, where do you begin? And I think the answer is you, you can locate yourself anywhere you find your entry point your critical entry point and that's where you begin and it doesn't really matter where it is so you could start let's say I, I, i'm going to start by seeing what's actually happening down amongst the weeds in in faculty land mm, i'm going to in faculty land <laughs> i'm going to look at what, what what this is doing to the subjectivities and the morale of staff i'm going to study this new policy on you know, we're an institution that won't tolerate bullying or harassment we've got an anti-bullying policy well where do you begin? You, you can begin with the script, but that's not going to get you very far, is it? A declarative statement about we do not tolerate homophobia, bullying, harassment, sexism, all that stuff. And most universities now sign up to that. So you think, OK, well, maybe if we start at the other end, let's start with people on the ground. Well, what do they say about the policy? And uh, what's their experience of it? Are they? Do they feel that they're being bullied? And they might actually say, well, yeah, it's not. But I don't feel bullied by colleagues or headed by. I feel coerced and bullied by the by the institution telling me that I have to produce all this research and and teach excellent uh, courses and administer this and don't have any spare time to be a human being because mm. I can't get the life work balance. Can, can I ask you about faculty land? So this is a, a phrase that I saw in the book. Is it from? Previous to that, though, no, no, it can't look. It, this, this was coined by this, this is a, a friend and a colleague of mine, Nick Lewis, who um, his story begins like this. That it, so we we increasingly have the separation of functions in our university, uh, and I think this is happening elsewhere, mostly Australian universities and United States universities, where previously 
you would have had um, sort of a, a kind of integration of professional or what used to be called a support staff, administrative staff, would be embedded in departments with the academics. And so there was a kind of easy uh, cross-pollination uh, and sharing of knowledge. You know, the, in most departments and universities used to be organized into departments. They would do their own teaching, but you'd have an administrator a secretary, uh, maybe a couple of secretaries and, and, and different gradations. They can cut costs and, and, and economize by basically cutting out all the administrative staff from the, from the faculties, relocating them in centers, a bit like, you know, the, the ethos is a bit like the call center. And in my own university, they did this and it was all predicated on, on a calculation that they would save $4.11 per transaction it was calculated in a dollar and dime you know um but this is how public institutions are being run these days by really by accountants who who are basically you know they they the bottom line is usually the the justification they say oh well, budgets are tight we have to make savings you know we're a public institution therefore we're responsible to the taxpayer the government is year on year underfunding us we have to make cost savings and this is the way to do it so you embark on major overhauls and restructuring and um so the phrase faculty land so one of my colleagues is he's um, under enormous pressure to submit his research grant application. Gone are the days where you could just, you know, write it, you know, spend all your time doing it, and then hand it to uh, the departmental administrator or secretary who would then, you know, do the paperwork. No, because there are no more departmental secretaries or administrators. So he literally physically has to carry it up the street you know, 500 meters away is, is a separate building. And that's where the research office is with all the professional administrators who run the research function. So they're physically, geographically, and conceptually removed from the rest of the faculty. And while he's waiting there, having, you know, submitted his thing and waiting to get the, the stamp, he overhears a conversation and two people going on uh, gossiping about, uh, and the phrase, he hears this phrase. He says, he, and he came back and that, you know, that evening in, as we were sitting over a cup of coffee, he said, you will not believe it. I just overheard a conversation with two administrators referring to, you know, how eccentric they are in faculty land. And I think for him, and this is, re I think we included it in the chapter we had in the book, because it, it just summed it up, the, the kind of, the ethos, the, the, the way in which the reforms have created such an absurd them and us dualism where administrators who's look let, let's be honest about it you know in a university why do students come to university it's to be taught you know and to get their qualifications the people who do who deliver the um the, the things that a university has to offer are the teaching staff and you know and sure and there are support staff there around that but we've now created this sort of system where um, the, the kind of the teaching lecturing staff have to report to the senior administrators. And I think that the phrase faculty land sort of summed up the, the mixture of sort of disdain and contempt and, and, and distance that these senior administrators were having uh, now experienced from their academics. We are just sort of eccentrics in a different world doing our La -la stuff. La La Land, right? Yeah. 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 Has yeah. that kind of sense. Um, I mean, you you work in this faculty land, right? And I mean, if, if we're going to call it that, um, but you also do research about academics. And I wonder uh, if you're familiar with uh, the interview between um, Pierre Bourdieu and Loic Wacant, where after Homo Academicus was published, where Bourdieu talks about how he lost some of his best friends by publishing Homo Academicus and how people uh, in the academy really just reviled him for shining a light on academic practices and things like that. So as an academic of academics in some ways how do you how do you study your own people and how do you do not lose all your best friends doing it yeah no well that's an interesting question but i mean yeah as a as a, <laughs> as a passport holding citizen of faculty land i mean um, i think most of my friends and colleagues are warmly appreciative of, of kind of my efforts to hold a a, a, a light up to what's going on I, on the whole uh, a lot of people in faculty land feel a little bit intimidated they feel a little bit 
scared about criticizing their their own employer and and rightly so because you know technically the 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 reforms that took place in New Zealand I don't know about Australia but the they changed the status of vice chancellors to literally uh, CEO. So our vice chancellors, though our universities, our chief executive officers, they are literally termed the employer. And are paid accordingly, right? Well, yeah, we'll leave aside the, the, the fact that, yeah, they, they're in very high uh, remuneration, uh, you know, boardroom, eye-watering salaries <laughs> from boardroom excess. Um, but they are... You know they are the employer, and you know they're the people to whom you know you have to account. So, I think if you're a junior lecturer or you're somebody who is seeking promotion, um, you don't want to make so much uh, noise. I mean, I, I may have lost a few friends from from the administration and the focus of of my criticism. Although I, I I'd like to think that the uh, the people who are, who appear in my analysis that some of them actually bothered to read what I'm saying. Um, it's quite hard and challenging and difficult to, to write critically about your own institution. And you, you tread a very delicate path. And I'm very conscious of the situation I'm in. And I'm quite wary about what I write and how I write. Um, I try to make sure that I'm not saying things and writing things that would really land me in deep trouble. Um, I'm sort of following a kind of Clifford Geertsian type idea that I'm going to focus on public culture things so that if I am going to report on things, they will be things that are out there in the public domain and I'm not breaching any uh, confidentiality clause. When I first started to do this, apparently I tied up the ethics committee for an entire day uh, just around my, my research a application and it's partly because I, in one of the forms it says, you know, will you use consent forms? And I said, no. To its credit, the, the Research Ethics Committee chair and vice chair came and, and talked to me. And they said, well, we want to understand. You know, we, we're not going to dismiss it outright. You know, we, we want to take your application seriously. But why are you not going to issue um, consent forms? And I, that's why I explained to them. I said, well... You know, anthropologists, we don't usually do that. You know, we, we, we're observing, participating and observing. And I said, so if I'm in a meeting, supposing that a meeting, a general meeting has been called and the, it's a budget meeting and the vice chancellor is explaining to the university or, or to Senate or something what's going on. It's a public meeting. There are 400 people there. Am I supposed to hand out consent forms and a participant information sheet and get their permission? And in a bureaucratic culture that, you know, most, most times, you know, if somebody puts a sheet of paper saying, can you sign this? Uh, in front of you, they, they back off and say, well, not without my lawyer present. No, I haven't lost friends doing this. I, 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 I do sometimes feel I'm, I'm sticking my neck out. But then on the other hand, as somebody said to me, you know, well, if, if the professoriate can't do it and don't do it, then who the hell can and will? What advice would you have for other anthropologists, studying people who are also researchers, who know what the process is, who are likely to theorize along with you, um, and also who are very conscious of the, the potential consequences of research. Studying people who, who are researchers is, is good. And the, the, the researchers themselves, yeah, they do research, but often people are not that reflexive about what they do. And um, the process of, say, you studying these researchers, often you're actually quite welcome and invited by those people because it provides them with a platform and a space to to reflect on what they're doing, and they love it. You know, when you, you know, they love the fact that you're interested in their world. So I've, I've always found that when I do research on 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 officials and people who work in organisations who who often feel neglected and, and ignored, and they feel that their their own work and their own sort of contribution is undervalued. So having a, a researcher who's genuinely interested in, in their worlds and, and how they make sense of them, um, it, it's, it's a mutually you know, beneficial kind of arrangement. And it's often treated as quite therapeutic, you know, cathartic for the people who, who you're asking questions of. And they say, oh, at last I've got an interested person who, who really wants to know about my world and mm. well, this is what it's like. Um, secondly, you know, what advice? Well, yeah, do it. I mean, you know, we're, we're academics and not journalists. This, this isn't about, you know, finding dirt mm. and it's more long term. And the fact that, you know, you're investing 
in this, if, if you're an ethnographer doing work on research, you're saying, it's much more important to try and really understand how these organizations and institutions operate, particularly as they're going through such major transformations. And surprisingly, not that many people are doing it. And thirdly, I think it would increase your employability because you you master not only do you master sort of certain skill sets of how you do this kind of research, but you you gain really good knowledge on on an on a sector on an area. So, I mean, if you're studying higher education as an ethnographer, it would set you up ideally to be um you know a really good head of department, administrator, research support, uh, liaison person, communications person, because you know you know the institution. You, you know where the bodies are buried. <laughs> and, and you know how, it, how, how to navigate through the, this often sort of Kafkaesque, uh, labyrinthine uh, edifice. What an excellent image to end with. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for that. That was a fantastic interview. Thank you. So that was it, me and Professor Chris Shaw. Today's episode was produced by me, Jodie Lee Trembath, with help from the other familiar strangers, and the executive producer on our podcast is Ian Pollock. And we're able to bring this podcast to you thanks to support from the Australian Anthropological Society, the Schools of Culture, History and Language, and Archaeology and Anthropology at the Australian National University, the Australian Centre for the Public Awareness of Science, and produced in collaboration with the American Anthropological Association. If you enjoy the Familiar Strange podcast, please subscribe. You can find us on iTunes and all the other familiar places. And don't forget to leave us a rating or a review with your likes and dislikes. It helps people find the show and it helps us make the show better. You can find the show notes, including a list of all the books and papers mentioned today, plus our blog about anthropology's role in the world at thefamiliarstrange.com. A recent post on the blog is actually one of mine and related to this podcast titled The Neoliberal University is Making Us Sick. Who's to Blame? Check it out at thefamiliarstrange.com. If you want to contribute to the blog or you have anything to say to me or the other hosts of this program, Email us at submissions at thefamiliarstrange.com or you could tweet us at TFS Tweets or look us up on Facebook and Instagram. Our theme music is by Pete Dabro. There's a link to his EP in the show notes. Special thanks to the excellent folks at the Stockholm Centre for Organisational Research as well as to Julia Miller, Will Grant, Nicholas Trembath and the awesome designer of our logo, Maud Rowe. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in two weeks for a panel episode, the first time all four familiar strangers will have been in the same country at the same time in four months. And until next time, keep talking strange. <laughs>